Okay, next up we have Kyle Dittmer. Mr. Dittmer earned two bachelors of science degrees from the University of Washington, one in geology and one in oceanography, and a master's of science degree in geology from Eastern Washington University near Spokane. Kyle is also a uh, USDA certified meteorologist. He was a hydrologist for the National Weather Service in Portland for 10 years, and he currently works for the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission as a hydrologist meteorologist for the past 14 years. In addition, Kyle teaches evening classes in the introductory meteorology and introductory oceanography at Portland Community College and is a part-time geology professor at Merrillhurst University. Kyle served as the president of this chapter of the Oregon AMS from 2005 to 2009. Ladies and gentlemen, Kyle Dittmer. Here. Winter weather forecast here. Also, I want to make mention, I think I was alluded to here briefly before, all these presentations you'll hear today will be posted to the Oregon AMS website here, probably within the next few days here, because I think we started doing that two or three years ago. That's right. And we have a video too this year, so. Yeah, so that's good. Also, there's going to be a summary of my forecast. I normally give this out, but since we have so many people, I don't want to cut down the tree and do that here. But this actually is very detailed as far as my particular forecast here. So, anyway, here. Move right along. As far as how well did I do last year as far as what I was forecasting here? I was forecasting near normal conditions, slightly on the warmish side here. On the beginning of the season, a little bit uh, cold toward the end here. And of course, things were a little bit topsy turvy. It was basically colder than normal here if you look here at this particular column. If you look on a seasonal basis, though, it actually worked out pretty good here. I was predicting an overall uh, average about minus 0.0. Point Three degrees uh, Fahrenheit down here for Portland, and still went up about minus 1.2. So slightly cold than normal. Wasn't that far off, less than a degree over the season. So that actually was good. Precip here was looking for above normal precip to start with here, season. At near normal here, about mid season, and then a bump up in the precip late in the season. It turns out it was actually extremely bearable. It was either feast or famine. It was like it was wet. It was like really, really wet and snowy, or else it was really, really dry. But percentage-wise here, it was only off by six percentage points. I was predicting on a seasonal basis about 112 percent or more, went over 118 percent. So that actually was reasonably good. But what about those snow events here? Well, <laughs> I was predicting three events between one to five inches apiece from December through early March here. Now, I observed eight. Of course, my observation point is different, and that's PCC Sylvania on the southwest side of town, which is a little higher elevation than the airport. It's about 600 feet elevation here. As far as the seasonal total based on that location here, we had almost 10 inches worth of snow here. So if you take my forecast of three events, let's say one inch a piece would be between three inches to 15 inches. So actually that's about halfway in between that. So actually that was reasonably good as far as on a seasonal basis here. So actually snow a little more than I would imagine. Actually all the snow we had in March, even though most of it was on the light side, was a bit here unusual. Also, I'm the only one who also does a long-term water supply forecast as well. I've got this methodology, which I'll explain here in a minute, my MEI method here, for the Columbia River with the Dallas, which is our main forecast point here uh, for the region here, is predicting for the January-July period here about 117 million acre feet. That's the same forecast I gave to you folks here a year ago. Uh, and then the real important one is the ones issued in April because that's where the different water management agencies like the Corps of Engineers, Bureau of Reclamation, BPA, and others who depend upon that water really hang their hat on the forecast. And because of the signal of the ocean, I was looking at an event of 132 million acre feet, 130% uh, or more, well, we went up with about 129. So depending whether you look at the pre-season forecast, plus or minus 9%, or in-season, plus or minus 2%, that was actually one of my best forecasts ever. So I was quite pleased with that result. So that's how last year stacked up. As far as my methodology here, as far as what I do, I'm really a holistic guy. I look at several different indicators. I put emphasis on solar activity, ocean cycles, as well as Pacific Northwest hydrology here. And as far as solar forcing here, this was this method is developed by late Dr. Landscheid of Germany here. This is really fascinating uh, insights. When I look at ENSO, I look at the MEI index, which I'll talk more about here in a minute. I also look at what's happening in the ocean as far as the sea surface temperature departures as well as the ocean upwelling up and down the west coast. I'll talk more about that here in a minute. And I have a unique hydroclimate approach in that I look at this relationship between what is happening here 
out in the tropical Pacific with our water supply here in the Pacific Northwest. I looked at actually developed a uh, early season volume forecast. Essentially, I back engineer uh, those predictor weather and water years to come up with the actual winter weather forecast here. And pattern recognition, I'm getting better at that. I mean, I've been doing this, you know, working at the Northwest Weather here for 23 years. But you know, looking here at the patterns and the signal here, I think is also key as far as choosing those predictor past past years. So looking here, I'm looking at pairs of El Nino and Enzo neutral years. I think that is you know, real, real, really key. Okay, so first off here, let's talk about the sun. The sunspot cycle, the sunspot counts in particular, are suggesting an El Nino year. This is a graph from NASA showing the actual the observed month to month sunspots and how they, they vary. It's the solid line here in the middle is the mean point, and the dashed line is the one sigma standard deviation going plus or minus here. And notice that our upcoming peak, the, the current solar cycle in right now, cycle 24, is about half the peak as of previous historic solar cycles here. Whether that's due to something funny happening to the sun, that'll be a story for a different time. But right now, we are approaching toward the peak of the sunspot cycle. Now, the research that Dr. Landscheid put together here years ago indicated that when you're near the peak of a sunspot cycle, you're more prone toward El Nino events. If you're near the trough, the sunspot minima, you're more prone toward La Nina events. And so that's something to consider here. So we're approaching the peak, although there's a lot of high variability here. So this pattern would suggest, you know, we're probably more prone toward El Nino events. Looking here as far as the sea surface temperature pattern here going throughout the wintertime season here, it's kind of a mixed picture as far as what's showing here. During El Nino years, we tend to see more uh, warmer temperature anomalies here in the central eastern Pacific here. This is for November. Uh, but when we go into the next few months here, it looks like we're having a breakdown of that pattern here. It looks like we're actually re returning toward uh, neutral conditions here, although we do have uh, batches of warm water throughout the Pacific here. But that's indicating here that if we are going to have El Nino, I really don't think that's going to be a big factor in our weather this year. Uh, I don't think it's going to really be lasting that long. I like to look here at the MEI which is a combination of the uh, SOI index, which tracks El Nino, the sea surface pressure, the surface winds, the temperature. And this is the track here, zero being neutral. And when you exceed the one threshold, you're going over to El Nino territory. If you're going into minus one, you're looking here at La Nina territory. And you basically have to be above that threshold for at least uh, three continual months here. Unfortunately here, it looked like we already hit our peak back in July. So that's when we really flirted with El Nino conditions. And we've gone down toward near neutral since that time. So we, ne we never really had an El Nino. In fact, I don't think we are going to have an El Nino this winter. We're having maybe what looks like El Nino-like conditions, but the zero index right here, we're very close to our neutral. I think we're going to stay here in this territory here for the rest of the winter time here. The PDO, which has been mentioned before here, it's getting increasingly negative here. Even though we've got vast seesaws here, it's been uh, quite negative here in the last uh, three years, which has been a really, really good sign. Actually, good sign here as far as Columbia Basin salmon. Since I'm in the salmon industry here, seeing patterns like this here, this is really, really good news for, for Pacific Northwest salmon because they've taken uh, quite a beating here the last several decades. My hydroclimate approach here in the forecast I produce here, the blue here is the really long term average going back from 1929 through 2012. The red line is the average of the 20 water years that I pieced together here for this year's forecast. And I actually went back and forth as far as which predictor years to use. Uh, on my summary sheet, which you'll see posted online here soon, um, I typically use about 20 uh, past weather years here. And I went back and forth. Initially, I modeled about half El Nino years, half Enso neutral years. I essentially went up settling here for about one third El Nino years and two thirds Enso neutral. I think that is good balance considering everything I'm seeing out here in the Pacific. So the red line actually shows the actual water supply distributed over the course of the entire uh, water year here. And this is unregulated flow down at the Dalles. This is without the effects of the dams. To kind of give you perspective here, if this were a natural flow of uh, 450,000, that would be actual bank flow down at the Dalles. 550 is about flood stage. And about 600 is when you start getting into like major flooding. So uh, with the effect of the dams here, the actual observed peak is much less. So what this is really showing you is we're going to be slightly above normal here on the national uh, peak flow here. So what is the forecast here? Well, first, just take a look here at expected temperature precipitation trends here. 
over the next few months here. As far as temperature, we're going to be essentially near normal, a little bit on the warmer side, but maybe plus one degree departures here throughout the winter time here. It does mean we can have some cold spells now, now and then during that time. Increase it though, will be a little bit all over the map. It'll be a little bit slightly below normal, uh, kind of flirting with if you think that 90% is below normal, we're kind of near that borderline most winter time, except for March here. Note the March, we can actually turn things around here and actually we're at slightly above normal. So keep your eye on March. It seems like March has had a lot of surprises for us here the last few years. As far as actual events here, I would expect high variability because I think we're going to see probably really more uh, and some neutral years play out rather than uh, El Nino. Uh, probably some heavy rain events. We definitely have seen that here both today and in the last uh, a couple of weeks here. Floods, maybe no major floods here, but I'm not really expecting any real major extreme events like the Arctic blast and perhaps maybe some of these high wind events. I just don't really think that's going to be happening here. My water supply forecast here, I'm looking for about 102 million, 102 million acre feet event here, for about 95% of normal. I think the recent Weather Service RFC forecast here for this week, I think it was calling for about 94, maybe 93% of normal. So this year our forecasts are actually much more close than not here, as far as that run up here in of July, January through July here. And of course the big question here, what about the snow events? Because with my methodology, I can predict the number of snow events and the probability of happening as well as the actual magnitude of each one here. And based upon everything that I'm seeing here, I'm going to expect four events here this year. One moderate event, about, about two to five inches, which we had here earlier this year here in about mid-January here. And three minor events, I call nuisance snow, about maybe an inch, inch and a half, based enough to kind of scare the city that, you know, oh, the big snowstorm is coming, but in fact nothing's really going to go on here. So, um, and I actually qualify this here as far as you know, looking, and this is actually according to ENSO categories, so I look at El Nino years, ENSO neutral, and La Nina to make this prediction. And for ENSO neutral here, I'm really looking at between three to five events here, so it's right, really like smack the middle here. So if you take the number of events here, four times depending here, that'd be either like about, either between five to eight inches of total snowfall. And Clinton Rocky's graph there, he showed what it would look like here as far as seasonal total Portland, which looked between like maybe five to six inches. It's actually right in line with what Clinton, so Clinton, that, that was a good graph you threw in there. That's, uh, it's, gra it's gratifying to see that there's uh, some actual uh, science behind it. As far as the particular snow probabilities here, I'm looking at about 25% chance here in November with an average total maybe about a quarter inch, but effectively nothing. December jumps to 60%, with an average about maybe about six tenths of an inch. So we might see some snowflakes in December, but what I'm looking at perhaps maybe toward the end of the month, we might maybe see some snowflakes around Christmas, maybe to New Year's. January, though, that jumps up to 80% probability, with an average about, uh, about two and a half inches. And then February, about 70% chance, with an average about an inch, 0.3. In March, actually 75% chance with a total of about maybe a third of an inch. So it looks like January through March are probably our, our best time to actually see snow with probably if you had a time for that one big event, probably sometime in January. And historically during the last two weeks of January is when you typically see that big hit in that regard there. In that regard, I think that is it for my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle Gibber.